Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Unstoppable. I'm your host, Kerwin Ray, and today we are talking all things chemistry with the unstoppable couple, Alexi and Preston Smiles, about all things love. We talk synchronicity, manifestation, and how love connects us all. This is a really interesting insight into looking at not only how to function in a healthy relationship, but more importantly, how to get into one in the first place. For those of you that are in a relationship or looking to get in a relationship, this is going to be one you're going to want to listen to. Ladies and gentlemen, listen up. Let's talk all things love with Alexi and Preston Smiles. Now, I, do I add the smiles on there? Because I know you guys are keeping. Your, <laughs> there's a little bit of separation in, in your in the way that you guys have come together. You guys got married recently, is we, that right? We're two years in wow. marriage. We've got a baby. Oh, we're like a fi- officially adulting now. You're officially a conscious family now, not yes. just a conscious couple. Which is huge. That's like yeah. a whole paradigm change in and of itself. A lot of people are like couple goals, relationship goals, yeah. conscious coupling. But truthfully, what we have found is the rubber meets the road when you bring in a third party that's oh a child. And like that's when all of our work really got put yeah. to the test. Or if you have a, like a polyamorous relationship. <laughs> <laughs> that might be another version yeah. of that. Or add a dog or something. Yeah. It's a third party in the relationship shifts everything, but a baby for real, for real. Yeah, because with, with babies, like they, they add this additional element to the relationship whereby they have their own function to be able to push buttons like dogs can't. Like yeah. a yeah. dog can push your buttons, but yeah. a baby? You can yeah. train a dog. You, you can train a dog. <laughs> you can even train it. Yeah. I'm, you know what they said the between kids and terrorists? You can negotiate with a terrorist, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. it's true. Exactly. Yeah, kids are very, and they need a lot of love and attention too. Yeah, right? yeah. And they give us a great opportunity to heal all of our wounds, which exactly. is just, beautiful. just beautiful. So for the people who are perhaps watching this who don't know, who you guys are, who maybe live under a bit of a rock. Why don't you guys maybe just spend like 10 seconds just sharing a little bit about you guys and, yeah, your story that got us to here. Yeah, well, um, we basically met, what, f- six years ago now. Mm-hmm. And before we met, we were both on Let our own. Let me get this right. You met on a date. Yes. If I got this right, yes. you were on a date. Did you, you were You were going to go on this date, and then you were like, oh, I don't know, this, this doesn't feel like the one. Yeah. But then you were guided by your intuition to go yes. on this date. You yeah. rocked up at this theater. It was completely sold out. Yes. Ten tickets, ten tickets ever sold. Yes. And then the, 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 the fucking the guy the sits guy us down. So, hey, we've got two extra seats in the front row. Yeah. Sits you down, and there's your beautiful wife. Life changed forever. It's like straight up like a movie. I, I think a lot of us, especially those who aren't in relationships that they would call, you know, uh, twin flame or like yeah. soulmate relationships, um, would would say like, ah, oh, does that really exist, right? Because that was a conversation I was in most of my life. Like, ah, uh, love, schmuv, like, yeah, but like, is it really like love at first sight? And like, yeah. for me, the moment I met her, it was like an instantaneous knowing that this is the woman I'm going to spend the rest of my life with, that I'm going to raise conscious children with, that I'm yeah, going right. to go on adventures with. And it just like hit me on the deepest level. And like, so, is this on the, the moment you laid eyes yes. on, on her? Yep. Wow. And you're thinking, oh, stalker. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he's, ready, he's ready. What's interesting <laughs> is like, go back, what, two weeks? Yeah. I was in London with a guy I was seeing at the time, seeing if it was something he was like wanting to have it be serious. And I was yeah. like, nah, let me see. Because it okay. wasn't, he was perfect on paper, great guy, but something wasn't a hell yes for me. Yeah, right. So he invited me to this guy's trip in London to see a football game. And I met one of his friends who happened to be his roommate and college buddy. And this guy was like, you're the female version of him. Wow. And I'm like, oh, cool. What's he do? And he tells me about what he's up to. And he's like, you guys got to work together. Let me put you in a Facebook message. Mm -hmm. Puts us in a Facebook message. I'm not great at checking my Facebook messages. He responds back and thinks I live in London. Because this guy's like, yo, I met this girl in London. She's amazing. You got to connect. Yeah, right. So he's like, yo, let me know when you're in LA next and we'll meet up. So when I met him in person, it was this context of work for me. Okay. Where I was like, yeah, let's link up. Let's see how we can partner together. You know, I was like business, business, business all day. And we met up for coffee for a business meeting. In my book, it was a date for him. <laughs> he's Is like, this before or after the, the, the concert where that happened? Where that went no, down? this is after. This so is after. So we that met was serendipitous. Yeah. yeah. So we met wow. two weeks later in okay. person. He's like, Alexi from London. That's how I knew. Yeah. Like, wow. So it was like I saw her Facebook, you know, and had this context of this girl I'm supposed to work with. Yeah. And when I saw her Facebook, I'm like, wow, she's gorgeous. She's doing work in Africa. She's into personal development. Awesome. However, whoever I'm going to date 
and Mary is not going to live in London. They're going to live where I live. And so I immediately her, took her kind of out of that conversation and just was like, hey, yeah, if you're ever in L.A., hit me up. Yeah. You know, and then two weeks later to have that intuition to go on this date that I felt like I didn't want to go on yeah. and get there and see her. It all was like the universe. Here's the thing. Synchronicity is always happening. Right. It's just a matter of our receptivity to, the, you know, the, the unknown, that which is beyond what the human brain can cognize. And so in, a, in that moment, my brain was able to cognize that the universe, God, Buddha, Allah, Krishna, whatever name is most potent for anybody who does that thing, whatever that was, was moving ahead of me and it was listening. Right. And so because I had asked, I had said, and, and here's the, the really awesome part about manifestation. And I think all of us will, will attest to this. There's been times where you just go, oh, yeah, I want to do that one day. And you let it go and you don't, oh, I got to do it one day. I got to have it. And you're not so Attached. focused on it's not here yet. You just choose it. And then you go back to life. Let it go. Yes. And so for me, I had chosen that it was time for me to meet my one. And then I let it go. And a couple oh, weeks later, she like I walk in and sit next to her. And I'm like, shut Oh God! <laughs> yes, Let's Krishna, do. Allah, Buddha, yes, yes. Oh, all of them. Yes, yes. <laughs> spirit guides, thank you. Yeah, spirit fingers all around. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So what's what's the backgrounds like? What obviously work work brought you guys together? You yes. guys are on a similar path. Yeah. Yes. Like, what are your backgrounds? Well, we both kind of have these like insane backgrounds. Um, I started at a young age in personal development, eight years old, listening to Marion Williams and Tony Robbins wow. through my mom. Okay, thanks, mom. Yeah, thanks, yeah. mom. And went to my first Tony event at 16, completed landmark education at 18, and um, actually was in the music industry and singing on stage with Ja Rule and signed to Murder, Inc. and did a whole world tour before the age of 20 years old and on multi-platinum albums. Wow. So I had like this whole- Is this a singer? As a singer. Yeah, right. I opened up for, for Ja Rule, which is insane. Damn. And a whole mm -hmm. other section of my life. Yeah. And quickly realized that this mediocre kind of rise to fame and fortune and seeing behind the scenes of that lifestyle, I got clear really quickly that that's not necessarily what I wanted yeah, right. or in that context. So I kind of pulled back, started a nonprofit organization, realized I wanted to be a giver instead of a taker. Went to Africa, started drilling wells out there, got back into entertainment, doing television and modeling. That did really well. That supported my nonprofit efforts, still doing personal development that whole time. And within that space, I recognized that I was using personal development for success and achievement and like killing it and doing really well. But my life lacked a lot of depth. Even though I was doing this great work in Africa, I wasn't able to fully receive it and I wasn't fully present to the gratitude and and, and just my own depth and my own spirituality. So at that point, around 26 years old, I started diving deeper into the caverns of the self and into my shadow and peeling back some traumas that I had went through that I kind of just tucked away and spiritually bypassed with the right personal Put it down development Put a lot of stuff. experience. And, yeah. yeah. And, and started recognizing like, wow, I've got a lot of potency here when I play with this part of myself. And I started then taking that work to groups of other women who had had sexual trauma, which I had experienced and recognized, wow, I'm actually really great at this. I'm really great at supporting other people. Started doing that on the side, got trained in life coaching when life coaching wasn't even a thing. And people are like, life coach, is that like a soccer coach? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, kind of. Right. And started doing that kind of quietly on the side because I was embarrassed because here yeah. I was a television host living this really cool life in New York City and doing this weird thing called life coaching on the side that nobody really knew about. And flash forward a couple of years, I'm, I'm working for E! Entertainment talking about celebrities and I'm, you know, I get handed my script to talk about Reese Witherspoon and what outfit she's wearing while she's playing tennis post baby. And I'm like, seriously, what the fuck am I doing right now? <laughs> like as an intellectual, that was like a moment where my mind died, yeah, right. you know, and I'm like, I can't do this. I can't, I can't be a puppet for somebody else's words. I, I know what life means to me and I know that there's something more powerful in there for me. And it's time to use my own voice and express my own opinions and, and use that voice for good. And that's when I left New York, moved to LA and started what I'm doing now. And we met. So how long was it after you moved from New York to LA that you guys had that 
a year, right? And so what's your background, Preston? Yeah, for me, mine is a lot different. Uh, I grew up uh, in LA and um, my mom very early had a conversation with my dad about me not being a normal child, a normal baby. And um, so you've been super identified superhuman early. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, but not in that way yet. Um, so uh, you know, hmm. Everybody who has children, you know, you, you want to make sure and you want to protect your kid. And so my mom and dad began to argue about whether I was uh, mentally all there. And and eventually they got me tested and. Um, you know, the test basically said that I was a genius in some areas and <laughs> almost brain dead in others. And, uh, you know, I ended up in special education classes. Okay. Um, after being a normal kid and being in the regular classes, I was taken out of those classes and put in classes with kids that were drooling on themselves and like playing with blocks. And in my, you know, seven, eight year old mind, these were the retarded kids. Yeah. And so if I'm in class with the retarded kids, then I must therefore be retarded. And for those of you who are offended by that word, I'm not speaking from the 36 seven year old consciousness i'm th- speaking from the, the, eight year old boy. the seven yeah. eight year old kid yeah. who was thinking that and so uh i made up a story about myself that i was dumb that i was less than that i wasn't as smart as everyone else and so i began to seek approval outside of myself and by the time i was 11 i joined a gang i started smoking weed uh by the time i was 15 i had stolen from every liquor store in you know a 10 mile radius i was fighting i was spray painting um, I was a leader, but not the kind that you would call a, a Lord a, of the Flies kind of leader. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was a different kind of leader. Leader of the resistance. Yes. yes. <laughs> and uh, when I was 15 and a half, a friend of mine got, got shot and killed. And that was the biggest wake up catalyst moment of my life at that moment. And, and I moved across country to a place uh, where there, I was the only black male in the entire school. And I became like this cool, like alien that everybody wanted to hang out with and quickly joined a new gang called Wexford Mafia, which was comprised of a bunch of rich white kids with BMWs and Mercedes. (laughs) And I had a moment um, headed to a party while we were drinking, smoking, listening to Tupac, Outkast and Biggie. I had a moment that hit me so hard and it literally shifted the trajectory of my life. Because I, I saw that the kids at my former school were doing that and going to jail. And the kids at this new school who happened to be Caucasian were doing it and they were going to Yale and they were, they were going to Harvard and they were, it, it, it was the same exact thing, mm. the same exact media doing the same exact thing. However, based on the environmental psychology, which I didn't necessarily understand and expectation, one group was having a certain experience and another was having a different one. And so for me, I then recognized at 15 and a half that underneath all of the stories that we have about each other, uh, that love is our truth and that we are more connected and more alike than we'd like to admit. And that sent me off on a path to going to college and I cheated my way all through college. And I'm actually, uh, for a long time, I wouldn't share that. I cheated the whole way through because although, um, although I had gotten bigger and I looked like a man, I, the little seven year old who believed he was dumb, stupid, and less than was still that wound and that trauma and that paradigm and that worldview was still running my life. And so no matter how well I did, I never thought I would study my ass off and then I would cheat because I had to win the game. Right. So the imp- I had this mask on and then I went to graduate school and I said, I'm not going to cheat. I'm going to see what happens. And it was a three year program and only two people graduated with a 4.0. That means straight A's the whole way through. And I was one of those people. And that was yes, that was one of those moments for me where I was like, I'm not stupid. Yeah. I actually have genius. How in old me. were you when you had that moment? I was 24. Wow. I was 23 when I had that moment. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, and I'm finishing the story here. At 25, I moved to back to LA. I became an actor. Uh, I was modeling. I got on this show Entourage for a season. And no, like, yeah, yeah. What? 
feel like yeah, now yeah. I need to watch oh, it again. Oh, come on. Which, which season? Season six. I, I was um, Lloyd's assistant. When so you Lloyd, see it, oh, he looks like, like a different human. Yeah, I, I, I think I can put it together. Yeah, yeah, so Lloyd became an agent. What? And then I became Lloyd's assistant, right? So there's, yeah, right. And I was on a bunch of other shows and stuff like that. Well and, done, Entourage. <laughs> that's, that's epic. Man. It was interesting, yeah. for sure. And, and uh, I got sick. I had a heart condition come up. And, what was uh, the heart condition? And they still don't know what to say other than I was going to take pills for the rest of my life. Okay. And because it was in my family, meaning my grandmother and even my dad's heart beats at 20% right now, because there were so many people in my family who had had heart failure and died, it was this thing where it was like, okay, you're going to need to be on pills from 25 to you, yeah. until we can figure yeah. it out, right? And so... Uh, the doctor, and I'm finishing the story here, that, that doctor said, uh, he asked me two questions, the cardiologist. He said, what are your stress levels and what's your diet like? And I said, well, what's a stress level? So I'm 25. I don't really understand what you're saying. And he said, tell me about your life. And I said, well, some people in my family are addicted to drugs and uh, struggling, and I love them so much. And my whole life, I felt like I needed to make it so I can save them so they won't die. And he said, and you've been doing this your whole life? And I said, absolutely. He said, well, that's, that would be a stressful life. I said, okay, I didn't know that, but awesome. And then he said, what do you eat? And I said, I eat food. And he said, tell me about food. And I said, McDonald's, Burger King, I drink beer, I smoke weed. I like, I, I just like went down the list, you know, I'm, cow's milk every day, cereal, you know, sloppy joes, hot dogs, like, you know, Wendy's, all the fast food stuff. And he said, young man, that's not food. And I remember this clear as day because I was like, what are you talking about? It's food. It's on the commercials. <laughs> my mom eats it. My dad eats it. Everybody I know eats it. There's nothing other than that. It's food. I eat this thing every single day since I was born. So like, what are you talking about? And he said, you know, as a doctor, I got to give you these pills and I got to tell you that you need to do this. As a father and as a concerned citizen, I suggest that you look into your diet. Well, that was the catalyst that broke this whole thing open, and it's why I stand here today. Because I went back home broken, afraid, like, like what the hell? I'm 25, I don't want to die. My girlfriend at the time, her mother said, Preston, I know you don't read, but I heard uh, because of the dyslexia, because I'm also dyslexic. She said, but I, I got this book by Jerry and Esther Hicks called Ask and It Is Given. And I just think if you just read a little bit of it, it'll, you know, maybe it'll help. And I said, I was so desperate, I took the book. And I went home that night and I opened it up and I got about four pages in and it said, your thoughts become things and you create your own reality. And I dropped the book. And I was like, what the hell is that? Because I am 25 years old and have never heard that statement ever in my life. This is literally no one I know would ever say that. I've never seen it on a commercial. I've never seen it in a movie. What are you talking about? And I start looking and I found this movie called Zeitgeist and it's conspiracy theory and all that stuff. And then, and then I became an angry Just vegan. Unraveled. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I became an angry vegan. I denounced my religion. I became that person in angry the friend vegan, group. Conspiracy yeah. The yeah. whole like, thing. I like <laughs> went nuts. And in that, I realized the Buddha quote that uh, you will not be punished for your anger, but by it, mm. because I was still angry. And, and while I had all this knowledge, I, I, my context, the way, my way of showing up was still angry. I was trying to convert everyone into veganism and to let go of your religion and all of this stuff. And it was from a context that still wasn't um, from my soul signature. Yeah. And so in that, as I discovered that, everything opened up and uh, I created a YouTube channel and it just kept getting bigger and I kept getting messages from people all, all over the world saying, yo, what you're doing is changing my life. And um, the rest Sharing is kind of kind of history, man. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when you guys came together, there was almost like this, this cataclysmic spark that created this new, Took it to another almost level. aligned path where you guys are now forging this kind of yeah, new history separately but together yeah. and so tell me about that because it's obviously got to do with this global movement around finding like it's not even a global movement everyone's wanted to find love you know yes. since Forever. they were born yeah, yeah yeah but i think oftentimes you know what we perceive as love is addiction you know yes. it's like codependency. <laughs> it's codependency yeah. 
Uh, why do you think, and again, this is going to be such a rhetorical question, but why do you think so many people have such a distorted perspective of what love is? Yeah, I mean, truthfully, we're fed an idea yeah. of love that is is bullshit. You know, it's Hollywood, right? Yeah, Hollywood, Disney, um, fairy tales. We're sold this idea that someone's going to complete us. And truthfully, I think a lot of people are trying to fill a gap within themselves and with their own life, fill a void that they're unwilling to fill themselves with somebody else. Mm. And it's why we have heartbreak at the level that we have heartbreak because literally, when somebody leaves, a piece of ourselves feels like it's leaving because we haven't filled that piece ourselves. And so Preston and I, when we came together, we were both at a point where we had done so much self-work mm. and so much of peeling back our own onion that when we came together, it wasn't like, I need you. It was like, this could really be an amplifier for who I am, for who you are, for what we're about. And that single-handedly, I think, has been the most powerful thing is that we came together as these two holes and that two holes, when they overlap, creates that little center of magic. And that center, that little small piece is our relationship. And it takes the two holes to maintain that beautiful center like diamond in the middle. And so many people are like, I'm a half, you're a half, let's complete each other, and let's be codependent, and let's never leave, yeah. and oh my God. Tom Cruise even made a kind of fan, it's like, you complete me, <laughs> yeah. right? Mm -hmm. well, I forget, yeah. Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire, right? yes. yeah. Yes. And, and honestly, I think deep down we all want love, deep down we all want to be seen, heard, felt, respected, but we cannot have that from somebody else if we're not willing to give ourselves that first. Yeah, that's funny you said, it's that deep down everybody wants love. Mm -hmm. But do we actually know what love is? Like, yeah. I guess my question to you would be, what is it, how do you define love? Yeah. Okay, so, so just taking a deeper cut, and I'll know Alexi believes this as well. So, it's, so chicken or egg, right? So there's Hollywood and then there's parenting, right? And, and the way that parenting has existed for the, let's say, last hundred years is, or even longer, is you get my love as long as you're doing what I perceive to be a good little boy or a good little girl. Well-behaved. The yes. conditional agreement. Exactly. Yeah. So our fundamental, the place where we start, where our brain is actually making mental maps about the world and how we uh, interact with each other, at that level, we are receiving messaging that says, Love is conditional. Yeah, transactional. You get this if you get good grades, don't mess up and, you know, are respectful to da 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 don't cry too much, don't beg too much for that milk, little boy, little girl. Like, there's all these conditions. If you're gay, I don't know if I can love you, right? This, there's so much to that thing that we are in the midst of a gigantic paradigm shift around how we even be with each other. And, and here's the thing, I'm not in any way proposing that there's a way not to be so unconditional. I don't know if I necessarily completely believe in it as, as like unrefutable law, like someone can be unconditionally loving forever, right? I think that there are conditions, right? We got married. And there are conditions to that marriage, right? Who she married, there's a condition to that Preston. But do you think that conditioning, that, that requirement for those conditions to be met really are in line with the consciousness of the individuals that are in that relationship? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a conscious agreement yeah. based on the level of consciousness that's brought to the table. Yes. Right? So we believe that love is unconditional, love in and of itself, yeah. but relationships are very conditional. Yeah. Yes. Very conditional. And, and even the smallest things like, do I love this man? Yes. Is that love unconditional? Yes. Is our relationship conditional and based on agreements that we mutually make together? Of course. Of course. How important are those agreements to be conscious though? Because do you think that's oftentimes where we get into conflict is where we have yes. our conditions? Yes. Because it's from our wounds. Yeah. So a lot, of, a lot of the conditions for relationships are based on our wounds, are based on our programming. Like you right? can't do this because it'll hurt me. Yes. Yeah. So, so in our work, we teach that you know, there are four aspects of the human being, right? So there's um, the social and historical, which means we were born into beliefs and interpretations, right? So that's, that's one. There's linguistic, that's two. There's biological and then there's quantum, right? So four. But the one, social and historical, a lot of us, those things go unexamined. Yeah. We don't actually 
go, do I still choose this? And like, where did I get this? Yes. Yeah. Where did that come from? Yeah. 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 Like, wait, whose rule is that that I'm following? Yeah. A man should, a woman should, right? And, and all of that conversation, the shoulds and the expectations that are based on the environment that you grew up, the religious sort of, even if you're not in a religion, the, the religious sort of rule of that country or that place all dictates how you show up in a relationship. So to have conscious standards is everything. Now, consciousness in itself is always expanding, moving, and growing. So to say that we land on something, we were talking about this yesterday, relationship. We talk about relationships and we say, oh, you know, tell us about relationship. Well, relationship is an organism and it's a freaking snowflake and it's not like any other one. Yes, there are aspects because we come in these human shells that are similar. However, there is not one single relationship that is the same as the other one. Including the relationship that we were in yesterday. Yes. So like this is so true for us because we're constantly in our own work and we're constantly looking into and investigating our own consciousness. Yes. Then our agreements shift because our own consciousness is deepening. If I'm recognizing like, oh shit, I have a pattern that's been playing out that I'm just acknowledging right now. (laughs) And I, I get that that pattern has created a certain agreement between us, whether conscious or unconsciously stated and agreed upon. I'm now going to bring that to him and say, babe, I just realized that that one thing I do is based on this story and this wound from when I was five. And I'm not committed to that wound anymore. I'm committed to my greatness. Mm. So let's recreate a new agreement around you holding me to my greatness and me holding myself to that. So it's constantly doing this. Wow. Yeah. What is the connection between relationship and values? Mm. This is interesting because I don't know if we have the same answer on this because P's got a little different take on values. But... For me, values shift as well. And this, this is one thing that I think a lot of people in personal development are like, your values are your values and da, da, da. For, for us, I know we believe that there's the values that actually run your life that most people wouldn't actually acknowledge are their values, like comfort, you know, um, certainty, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> like dependability, a lot of people, safe. But when we start getting into some of the the, 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 the the aspects of relationships where we bring up the wounds within each other, a lot, a lot of those conditions, wouldn't you agree, are rooted in values. They're rooted in the experience that we've been up, brought, up, brought up with to either deem as important or not important. Yes and no. So trauma, which, what's interesting about this is our, our mind during trauma makes imprints. Mm-hmm. So whether or not you consciously had a value or even unconsciously had a value in your parenthood and um, how you grew up in your family or in your society or whatever, based on a trauma, and a trauma could be something as simple as your dad not saying he loved you ever or not saying good job. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, you're like, (laughs) 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 but that's a trauma, right? And it doesn't have to be this crazy trauma that people are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened to you. Trauma is a spectrum. Spectrum. And our brain's constantly imprinting. Mm. And once it makes an imprint, that imprint becomes a new paradigm, a new reality where you start filtering all your reality through that filter. And that filter is there to keep you alive. That filter is there to keep you moving, to keep the species Mm. going, right? So now you might think, oh, I value love and I value leadership and I value freedom. But truthfully, all of those values are coming through a filter of, is this safe? So this is why values are such an interesting and intricate thing to play with Mm. because until we actually know our filters and the masks that we wear and our identity, all the personal development work that you're doing Yep. It's kind of like null and void. <laughs> which, is, which is why she said I would have a different take because I think values are bullshit. Yeah. And we have friends who teach that as their profession. <laughs> yeah. and like that's like it's their main thing. Stupid. Yeah. Like it's, it's literally, it doesn't matter. Like it does and it doesn't, right? So we can write our values down on a piece of paper and say, these are my values. And the reality is what, uh, what Alexi was speaking to is there are biological imprints yeah outside of just the the psychological ones that are happening that most humans on the planet have never faced off with. They're not even aware of them. Boom. So so if I'm in the conversation of these are my values, when in reality it is a deep 
freaking wound from when my uncle touched me in a way that was inappropriate, but I haven't faced off with that thing. And I go into a relationship with you and say, well, my value is that you don't get to talk to other women, you know, because women are threats or... Do you think we overcomplicate what values are? Yes. Because to me, when we look at what a value is, it's a fundamental reason to do something. It's yeah. a fundamental thing that is either, it's either important to me or it's not. I yes. either... And I either equate a value to that because I really like that. Yes. Or I don't like that. Yes. Yeah. But it seems like we've created this doctrine of yes. what values it's should these be. Words and these, these yeah. words. Yeah. And they're hard coded and they don't change. You know what but I think that is? I think when they first created life coaching, <laughs> they needed some like hardcore exercises yeah. for people to do yeah. to make them think that they were getting their yes. money's worth. <laughs> so when, when we look at unconditional love, like do you, do you guys believe unconditional love is a thing? Breath, air, yeah. nature, nature, God, everything that is, we swim in unconditional love. Yeah. In the context of two human beings coming together. I don't believe it. Yeah. As okay. long as there's relationship, there is no. contract. Yeah. No. There is contract. Now, will I, d- despite whatever happens to us, will I always love this man? Absolutely. I can say that about my exes. I still love them. Am I choosing to be in partnership with them? Am I still in love with them? No. Love and in love, two different things. Mm-hmm. Relationship and love, way two different things. So I do think... Here it is. Unconditional love. Here's Okay, so we would have to look at love, right? Because a lot of people think love is roses and flowers in the parks and butterflies. Well, we've got to define love yes. to get a good baseline. Because exactly. we've, got, we've got Hollywood love. Yes. Yeah. And then we've got David Snarch love, which is, you know, marriage doesn't start until the problems do. And real love is yes. being able to see both sides of an individual yes. synchronously and to see the wholeness of them not ex- and still be consciously willing to choose them yes. despite however many buttons that darkness is pushing that relates to however many wounds that we... And for me, it yeah. would be all of that and consciously unchoosing them such that they get their highest growth. So in our society, it's about staying together for 400 years even though you hate each other. Yeah, and like- for me... <laughs> Real unconditional love is like, oh, you're being abusive and you're actually hitting our child or me, then I love you enough and I love you unconditionally enough to remove myself from that equation. So it, it, it's, it's all of that. And it's such a complicated, there's so much gray in this conversation, which oh, I yeah. love you're like yeah. playing with us like that. Because we can do this all day and I see you possibly, yeah. you can too. Um, there's well, so, yeah. And I, I want to say too, like I, I believe that we cannot even define love yeah. until we define what love means to each of us, right? Mm. Like we each have our own definition of love based on our True. historical and social upbringing and based on how we actually love ourselves. Because truthfully, we're only loving each other to the capacity that we love each- ourselves, mm. yes, right? Yes. So how can I define love outside of my experience of love within myself? And here's, this is where the problem lies because most people have no idea how they even love themselves. Most people have no idea how to love themselves. Most people aren't even focused on themselves or focused on that other person. I just need to meet that person and then my life will be better. And that is where the problem lies, in my opinion, is most people have not done the work on the self deeply, where it's not just about mindset and strategy and how to be successful, but like how to actually love who I be, Yes, warts and all, right? The minute we do that work is the minute everything starts to shift because we start viewing ourselves from a different lens. We start viewing the world then from a different lens and we can see partnership from a different lens because there's a level of compassion and empathy for our own humanness that we then can accept somebody else's. But until we accept our own, we can't possibly accept somebody else's. And it comes back to that chicken and the egg. Because most people are looking for the other to complete them versus completing self to find the other. Yeah, and they're looking for somebody else to fix them yeah. too. So How do you recognize if you're in that pattern? Like, because there might be someone listening to this go, okay, this sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second, get out but, of my head. But there might be other people going, yeah, don't get it, like, yes. at all. Yeah. What, what's a good little kind of self assessment to be able to identify, like, where you're at on the codependency scale of, you know, whether you're in a relationship for growth or yeah. whether you're in a relationship because you actually feel like you physically are. You know, not whole unless you're in a relationship, in relationship with another. Yeah. I mean, we always say feedback. Feedback is your best friend. If you can look at the past four people you dated and like really look at it from an objective, honest perspective and go, how did that end? Why did that end? How did I show up in that? Mm -hmm. Was I the one to go, I'm out the minute things got a little complicated, the minute my stuff started coming up? Or was I the one to go, you know what? 
I'm going to take responsibility. I'm going to lean in. Like, how are you showing up in that? And something to preface here and to put in the space, conscious relationships are about the work. You know, a lot of people have this idea like, oh, if I meet the right person, it'll just be easy. It shouldn't be and work. And just as a side note, and that includes self. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. 100%. Self-work, self-work, self-work. Always, yeah. right? But, but especially when you meet somebody who's a conscious individual, you know, everyone's like, conscious couples, relationship goals, hashtag, this is what I'm after. Is it though? Because a lot of people, the minute you get with a conscious partner, they're going to hold a mirror up oh. to you. And it's, and it's painful. Oh, yeah. And they're not going to let you run. And they're not yeah. going to let you manipulate. And they're not going to let you bullshit yourself. Yeah. And I have been in relationships that have not been conscious, and they're easier because I can get away with you can more. Just blame. <laughs> you can just blame. Oh, it's her fault. Yeah. It's his fault. Yeah. Here's the thing. I, I can wanna, manipulate. You know. It's I so want to add to this conversation about that like barometer, right? So a, a question I'm constantly sitting in and challenging myself to is not needing Alexi to be different in order for me to experience my own joy, my own personal freedom. So if you're in a relationship that is dependent on that person acting in a particular way or saying a particular thing or doing a particular thing in order for you to feel good about you, then you're probably going to need to reassess. Yeah. And just going to the conversation of, you know, well, then should I get out? No, no. The work is in relationships and out of relationships. All of this could happen in one. Yeah. This is not the, the it time to go. It can accelerate in one. Exactly. You can take it to a whole other level. <laughs> like relationships really are like accelerators for growth. The best like personal yeah. development workshop yeah. you could ever take. <laughs> and kids, when you add a kid into the mix, it's just how mm-hmm. yeah. rocket fuel. Yeah, 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 but this is a great yeah. question because, you know, there's three levels of relationship. There's dependent. Yeah. Where you're codependent on each other and you complete me and I need you to, you to do this to make me happy. Then there's independent where you have two people who are like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. You, do, you kind of cross over on mm-hmm. sex and like hanging out, but you're not really playing together and interweaving your lives together. Mm-hmm. That's interdependent where you're like really playing in that space of like, let's dance together. Like, yes, I'm independent. Yes, I'm a whole soul being, but let's see what happens when we like yep. merge our energies. And I think a lot of people are in that dependent phase where they're like, Right. And then they go, well, I need to just be independent. And then they go into this fierce freedom thing where it's like, well, I, I've been codependent. Now I need to just decide who I am. I need to go and do my own thing. We need to take time apart. I need to be by myself. Mm-hmm. Right. Versus let me see who I can be in relationship mm-hmm. as a whole soul being completing and fulfilling all my own needs, but also playing in the space of saying, I want to see what I can do for you too. And as a gift. And. It is absolutely, absolutely okay to be a mess while in all of that. Yeah. Because I think relationships that are messy. They're super oh, messy. And I think this yeah. is one of the challenges that we have with like relationship ideals and parenting ideals. Yes. Like relationships are messy. They're loud. Kids are loud. Yeah. They're messy. <laughs> Buggers, poop, oh, yeah. messy, like just <laughs> mad but I think tantrums. It's this, you know, it's this expectation that it's not supposed to be messy. It's that's, supposed to be fairy tale that I think creates heart, you know, a lot of the issues that's, that we're dealing it's, with. That's exactly why I put that in there because I could hear someone else's brain listening to this going, oh, well, well, then I'll, you know, do it elegantly. And like, sometimes you're tripping, you're falling, it's messy, it's nasty, it yeah. doesn't feel good. And yeah. that is where, so, so what imprisons us also points to our freedom. And every single time that we find an area, both Alexi and I are relentless about finding those areas where we're still hiding out. Because we know that that literally is the golden ticket to our personal freedom and to up-leveling. Not to try to fix because I was never broken. I'm perfect, whole, and complete, but not finished. I'm in a process, and that process is so freaking beautiful when you let go of the idea of it needing to look a certain way and feel a certain way. Because looking and feeling is what we came here for. That is the isness, that's the juice, that's the power of life, yeah. right? Yeah, and we find those areas yeah. to like go into yeah. mostly when we're in conflict. Yep. Like, hear that for yeah. whoever's listening. Talk, but those, but how, but how important is that as a life rule? It's in conflict that we find these yes. things. The struggle but makes it's, us. It's, 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 failure is the key. Like, whether it be 
in uh, business, whether it be in yep. the gym, whether it be in a relationship. The goal is to find that point where it doesn't work anymore. That's it. And yeah. failure in and of itself has been the thing that has tripped most people up because it's the fear of failure. Yeah. But if we just reframe... But even labeling failure is wrong. Like we're taught that yes. failure is bad. So we need to reframe yeah. it. Like for us, failure is feedback and feedback gets us one step closer. And if I have more feedback, I'm 10 steps closer, yeah. right? Versus the person sitting on the sidelines going, we should really, we should try this, yeah. or maybe I should do this. or And you're not actually getting real life mm. feedback. Nothing's changing. Failure is a poor teacher. Yeah. We have become a society of control freaks. Yes. And and it goes back to that conversation around. So, so failure is attached to little Jimmy doing little Jimmy. And, and this happened to me as a child. Uh, one of my first basketball games, they, they tipped the ball in the air and I got the ball and I went to the opposite direction and I scored a point for the other team. And I laugh because that's, that was my very first rugby union game. Yes, yeah. yes. And that, a trauma like that and the disappointment of your father and, and everybody in the crowd can be the thing that would have someone, and it did, it literally affected me, and it has affected me for a long time, it would have somebody attempting to control everything they possibly can so they never disappoint ever again. And so we have a whole society of people who have had an experience where they didn't get the grades their parents wanted them to get, or they did, they made a stupid mistake, or they cursed, or they were singing too loud when mom just got fired from her job and she said, turn, the little kids are better seen than heard, right? And moments like that become our whole life. And we walk around trying to control everything so that we never experience that pain again, which just goes back to the trauma. So if, if, if you take anything out of this, it's to question the patterns, yeah. right? We're constantly looking at like, like what's happening here? Even in this podcast, like, okay, do, how much of me wants to be here? Right? Is that ego? Is that because I want to be the star? Like what's here right now? And when we play that game and we question it, we can get out of our own way and allow spirit, higher self, whatever you want to call that, to do the speaking, to, to, to do the moving, to do the communicating. And, you know, Jim Rohn used to talk about this. When you make room for your gifts, your gifts will make room for you. Alexi and I are prime examples of that. We constantly are questioning the patterns, moving out of the way so that spirit can speak to, through, and as us. And because of that, we have and are experiencing a powerful life in this lifetime. <laughs> we can almost end the podcast right there. I got but, self-conscious. <laughs> I, I, everybody's quiet. I'm like, oh, no, that's good. Like, that was, I was saying, the boy's challenging. It was, yeah, yeah. It was coming But through. that's a thing, you know? Yeah. No, that's cool. Mm. So uh, there's, there's two more places I want to go before we wrap this up. One yeah. of them is how do we know if we're in the right relationship? Mm -hmm. And then we'll move on to the one and the many. Mm -hmm. But let's, because some people who listen to this, they're going to be in a relationship and yeah. they're going to be going, you know, am I in the right relationship? And then there's going to be the other half of people going, I'm not in a relationship. How yeah. do I find that one? So let's start with the people who are in a relationship. Because yep. yeah. one of the things you said, like if you realize that relationship is bad, that doesn't mean you go, oh, okay, I'm out. I'll yeah. go and try and find another one. Yeah. Yep. It's just an indicator to do some work. Yes. But, yeah, because truth is, if you're like, I'm out, I'm going to go find another one that's yeah. better, the same pattern is going to show repeat. Yeah. yeah. And so I think for us, that question is so nuanced, right? Every relationship is so different. If there's physical harm involved or somebody's safety is at risk, it's not the right relationship. And you got to love yourself enough to move out. Now, if there's no physical harm or no one's safety is at risk, but your ego's at risk, that's the right one right now. How do we know? Based on results. It's here, right? And Preston and I believe that everything that's here for us is a teacher. So if you're in a current relationship where you're up against your shit, where you're, you feel like you're like this, there is something within you that needs some work. There is a level within yourself that gets to be looked at. There's something that needs to be questioned. And for Preston and I, if we're like working with a couple and they're in it, we say, go 30 days harder than you've ever gone before. Commit again, right? Look deeply at all the things that person is doing right. Look deeply at all the things and all the ways that you could be doing better. You could be showing up differently. You could be acknowledging more. 30 days of fully going in mm -hmm. instead of pulling out. Because most people are like, if they're questioning, should I be in this relationship? They're already out. Yep. They're one foot out the door already. And of course, you're going to see more stuff that's not working because you're already looking for it. Yep. So we say go 30 days all in.
Like go fucking hard, go all in so that by the time those 30 days are up, if you're like, mm, yeah, no, I'm good. <laughs> then, you know, yeah. then at least you've given it a hundred percent. Yeah. It, what she said, I'll just <laughs> add that, um, one of our teachers is probably the best in the world and the relationship space, uh, his name is John Gottman. And oh, yeah, they got there. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And one of the things that they talk about is the difference between solvable and perpetual problems. And I think that a lot of couples have a lot of perpetual problems that they think their relationship is broken because of those things. Because they haven't been able to solve them yet. Yes. But they're unsolvable. Mm. And this is what Gottman talks yeah, about. Yeah. So, so for us, having that distinction, right? Because distinctions open up new worlds for us. The moment we have a distinction called door, then we have a new possibility. And the distinction of understanding the difference between a solvable issue versus a perpetual one can really be a game changer because then you can surrender to, oh, okay. So and a prime example of this would be Alexi grew up and had some certain traumas and those traumas caused her to not want to leave the windows open and the doors open while we sleep at night. Well, I grew up the exact opposite way where I leave everything open and I'm just captain trust everything. <laughs> and so this is going to be a perpetual thing for the rest of our lives. And so instead of me punishing her or saying, well, what's wrong with your paradigm and your worldview? You need to be fixed. Right. <laughs> and her saying the same about me, you freaking hippie boho, like, you know, that kind of thing. We can now surrender into, oh, that's just a perpetual thing. Like, oh, it's all good. Like, I, I'll, I'll meet yeah. you right there. And, and like, then do I choose that? Yeah. yeah. Like, do I choose that? Because the truth is, and it's, I forget the exact number, this but it solves, it solves the age old problem of the seat up, the seat down. Yeah. Like, you could literally just remove I'm, all yes. friction <laughs> from every piece, relationship ever thing. moving yeah, forward. Yeah. Socks on the floor, yeah. cupboards open, yeah. all the things. Does it really matter? Does it really yeah. matter? And, you know, it's, it's one of those things, pick your battles, yeah. but understanding that some battles are going to be lifelong battles. Yeah. And if you choose to pick that, as your battle, your relationship's going to suffer. And you'll have plenty to battle about. Every <laughs> exactly. And, and Gottman says it's something over like 70% of problems in a relationship are perpetual, unsolvable problems. Yeah, right. So if we actually just get that and go, is there a middle ground here that we yeah. can work on? If there's not, do I choose it? Yep. Do I want to be right or do I want to be happy? Yeah. yeah and do yeah. I choose who you be now with nothing changing? Yeah. Yes. And if I can choose that, great. Then I can know I've chosen this. Yeah. And I'm cool because I've chosen it, you know, and I think a lot of us in the beginning of relationship, we choose the person. We see all the things. We see all the, the red flags, the orange flags, even the green flags. We're looking at all of it, but we're focusing on the green flags because we want to make the person the person because we want relationship, right? People are lonely. They want love. So it's like, I'm going to focus on all the amazing things that Preston is. Yep. And then a year in, I'm going to say, Preston's changed. <laughs> Some things about Preston. No, Preston has always been Preston. My focus has shifted. Mm. I've focused from green flags yes. to now yellow flags. Oh. Now add three years to the pot. Mm. Those yellow flags are starting to become a little more orange, yeah. right? Where I'm like, that first month, oh, I love the way your nose whistles when you sleep. <laughs> By year three, it's like, I'm going to fucking smother him. Right? Like, like, <laughs> I need to make this stop right now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> so the one. You know, we often hear it talked about, they've written books about it, they've written movies about it, you know, there's documentaries about it, you know, and you guys are a great example of, you know, two people who have found the one. Uh, I guess the first question is, and I've kind of primed it with uh, that big build up, like, is the one, is it a real thing? Or is, a, is there a one that is, and there's a few of them out there, like, yeah. what's your take on this? I'll let you start, and then I'll come in. Because where I'm going with this is, because yes. there's the one, like, we often... Have this one and the many concept. Yes. I don't know if you've heard of the one and the many. No. But no, when we're with the one, we're thinking about the many. Yeah. And when we're with the many, we're thinking, thinking about there's got to be the one. Yes. So, yeah. So, so you I, always want what you can't have, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> Fuck, man. Yeah. We're screwed, perpetually. <laughs> so my belief is that it's the one for now. The one for now. And, like, if we just really break that down, like... That's seven, eight billion people on the planet. And out of that many people, this person is in your space. And 
when, when we let go of time, and time meaning success, and we start playing in the one for now, and now, and now, then we start to see the miracle that is attraction and the law of magnetism and uh, being used by something maybe greater than ourselves and the beautiful lessons that come out of these uh, soulmate relationships. I believe that everyone is a soulmate, including you and I. And it's how we choose to be with that, whether it be romantic, friendship, or just a one-time thing. I've met people once that shifted everything for me. And then I've been with someone like Alexi for years, and I, there's so much more unfolding out of that. It's a spectrum, right? And so we say in our work, the, the one, the, the two and the three can be just as important as the one at times, right? But, but like letting go, the moment we let go of time and it needing to be 19 years or 42 years together or whatever the case may be, then, then, then we can get like present to the miracle. That is human here and now. Yeah. yeah and I, I would have answered that the same way. Like everyone is the one because with as many people as there are on the planet, the fact that we've come in contact with whoever we've come personally in contact with, yeah. that's a miracle. And there's something there for us. Again, anything that's in front of us is a gift. Yeah. Right. And when you, when we're married, you know, we've put real life constructs around this one present moment that we had. And the reason we did that is because we recognize that together we are amplifying, right? And I'm powerful by myself. Preston's powerful by himself. But together we know that we hold a certain medicine that happens to trigger the shit out of each other in certain areas and call forth the deepest parts of ourselves that still need work. And we're committed to that within ourselves. So we committed to each other because we recognize a playmate in that. Mm -hmm. We recognize a workout buddy. Do you also recognize the amplification, not just of the energy for the work that needs to be done, but also for the procreative nature of the force that a man and the woman, you know, even Napoleon Hill talked about it in Think and Grow Rich. He yeah. talked about in chapter 11, the, the law of sex transmutation. Yes. Where he, you know, after 27 years of research, the 500 wealthiest men at that time, he discovered they all had very high sex drives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And from that, I, I surmise that, you know, any man or woman who has the discipline to focus sexual energy onto things other than the act itself mm -hmm. can create wealth from their wildest dreams and access the realms of genius. And, you know, tantras, tantric yogis have been talking about this for a very yeah. long time. Yes. Yeah. So I'm curious to know from, from your perspective, has your bond, has your unity, have you actually seen that? have commercial benefit in terms of the amplification of sure. the brand, the business, and everything else that comes with it. A thousand percent. When we came together, our entire business exploded. And everything we do together, Explodes. like if I put something on social media and 2,000 people like it, awesome. I put something on social media that has Alexi in it, that you can triple yeah. that easily. thing easily, yeah. if not quadruple it. And so it's, I think they were... We're in a time where people are needing to believe in conscious partnership mm. and, and what we represent and how we go about living our lives and, and how transparent we are with the perfectness that is the imperfectness of our relationship. You know, it, it's, you can see it from a mile away. Alexi is an A type boss Bia and so am I, right? And so what do we do with that? What do we do with that when both of us are, are, can be in our masculine and drive, 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 drive? How do we take one hat off when we work in the same house that we have sex in, that we cook in, that we dance in, that we play in? And like that dance is actually an art and not many people can do it uh, at the level that we're doing it at. And, you know, we've been together five years, but that five years is like 20 years because out of 365 days a year, only seven were not together. And out of those days, maybe an hour or two each day were not together. So you're talking about an amplification of a, we are attached like on a biochemical level as well. Our nervous systems play together. I can feel her when she's not even in the same room. 
And so we're playing and it's amplified everything for sure. You know, uh, when one or more are gathered, I am there. I think Jesus said in the Bible and, and I think, you know, he's talking about the feminine and masculine coming together, but then you like take that out a little bit and like, we're staring at the same mountain. Mm. Yeah. And, and, since we've come together, like even our child is a product of that. Mm. Like our child is a straight up How love baby. Is... He's five months. Five months. He's so, amazing. Like we, <laughs> we straight up had sex and right after we had sex, we we're like, that was baby making sex. Like we just made up. We said baby. it. We literally we said it. We it. We're like, that's probably it. Yeah. <laughs> that's we like, definitely yeah. just made a baby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he's a product of that. Yeah. Like he, uh, he is so amplified. People meet him. They're like, Whoa. Yeah. Like he's an amplified being. And that is a product of us coming together in our highest truth and our highest consciousness and our highest presence and creating from that space. So whether it's a baby or a business, mm. that's what we're committed to. How do we keep getting out of our own way to be mm. present with what's here to create what's possible? Yes. And just to caveat for everybody listening, we're not special. No. We are special and we're not special. We're special because we do the work. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. Regular humans yeah. who actually just are so committed yeah. and this is all we do all day, every day. It's what we actually love yeah. along with surfing and creativity and Burning Man and all kinds of other things. But like we live this work and work because we live this work, it, you know, you make room for your gifts, your gifts will make room for you. There's one thing I want to finish on, which is um, something a little bit practical. Uh, you were talking about in one of the videos I've watched of yours, uh, the five steps to calling in the one, mm-hmm. which I thought would be like just something nice and practical to end on and maybe yeah. a bit of an interpretation for both. Yeah. But I- expand on that. Like say, let's say someone, you know, they're, they're, they're starting to recognize within themselves, they've got to do the work. They're going to start doing the work. They're in the work. They're doing the work. Yeah. They're on their journey. But they're like, you know, I'm ready to meet the one. Mm-hmm. Like what's the process? Because you've actually got like a five-step process. It's like, I wow, do. You live. Yeah. I think it's probably changed since I made that video. Okay. We can just go back. Yeah. We'll just, I think the biggest thing, if you're doing the work and you're up to what you're up to and you're like deeply into your passions and you're living your expression, you can't help but be a magnet. Mm -hmm. You can't help but radiate a certain frequency. And when you drop the attachment to needing to find the person, to having, oh, are you going to set me up with so-and-so? I need you. Do you have any conscious single men friends? Like we get people who ask us that all the time. They're so attached (laughs) to finding. We get people who we don't even know inbox us and like, hey, do you have any conscious males that are single in your community? And it's like, really? But truthfully, when you're just living and breathing, it's you, the highest expression of that, you magnetize it. I wasn't looking. I was committed to living my highest expression of me, living my passion, living my purpose. And it's often when we're not looking when it drops right into our lap. It's like our keys. You ever lost your keys or your cell phone and you're like, where are my, you know, where are my keys? Usually on my head or in my mouth. Yeah, exactly. And the minute you give up and you're like, let me just go get a glass of water or go do whatever, they're right there. Mm -hmm. You're like, I look there, right? So my number one step would be stop being so attached to finding it. Mm. Just keep doing you, boo. Keep doing you. Just keep, be, yeah, yeah like you, yeah. love your life. Love your life. Go out and experience mm. and express yourself and know that from that point of fullest expression, you are sending out a radio frequency for somebody else who is attracted to that expression to find you. Mm. Yeah, I'll add, and number two would be uh, belief. It is impossible to focus on lack, the lack of conscious men, conscious women, the lack of people who are attracted to me, the lack of, when you focus on that, you cannot create abundance from that space. And so the number two would be, you know, a reminder that it is done unto us as we believe. And so the belief structure of, okay, 7.5 billion people, 8 billion people on the planet, Do I actually believe that the universe, God, Buddha, Allah, Krishna, whatever name is most potent for it, do I actually believe that God is done with me? Out of all the people who are finding love, God said, you know what? Your last boyfriend, Tom, that's it for you. You're going to have cats for the rest of your life and it's not happening. So we have to actually face off of that and go, okay. Clearly, the universe isn't done. Yes, I'm still mourning the breakup or whatever the case may be. But like, I know that my man, my woman is out there doing the work, skiing, 
freaking, you know, whatever they're doing, they're living their passion. Dating somebody else yes, maybe right now. Exactly. Getting going, some learning. Going through a breakup, <laughs> like blowing up a business and starting over again. And I'm going to meet them, you know, whenever, but they're on their way. That is so huge yeah. because we then set into motion this, uh, this uh, secret sauce called isness called God that moves 10 steps ahead of us. But we, it's the belief is one of the most important parts of that. Number two. Yeah. I, I want to add a different word too, to, yeah. to like supplement that is trust. And this landed for me this year. Yeah. It's like belief for me is like still a mental thing. And I believe certain faith things. Is, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. faith is great. Yeah. Right. And, and I believe certain things, but it wasn't until I like fully like trusted it. It was like, Oh, that's just, it's locked and it's loaded. Done. Yeah. Like it is done. Like actually leaning into the trust of that is huge. Yep. Which is what you're saying essentially. Yes. I just mm. wanted it. See how, she, see how she wiped yeah. me just now? <laughs> I, I just need to re that. See how she just wiped me right there? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, you know. Um, number three, be on the lookout. And I think this is really interesting. And this is what was true for me in our relationship. Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking, but I was listening. I was on the lookout. Because he didn't look like, and and he wasn't my typical prototype for what I thought it was going to be. And I think a lot of people have this idea. Oh, they're going to be this. They're going to look like this. They're going to have this type of job. They're going to be this type of person. And then we're like filtering and sifting for that type. And we're, we might be missing hmm. the magic that is that person. And Preston, when he showed up in my life and we had that business meeting date mm -hmm. for Preston, I saw something in him that my body was like, whoa. It was like my body was listening subconsciously. I wasn't even thinking about him as a potential partner. I was still trying to figure out this other guy, right? But my body was like, pay attention, pay attention. There's something here. And I remember listening to that. I took about a month to listen to it. And we hung out a lot as friends and did a bunch of stuff that we both loved together and totally nerded out on personal development and spirituality. And my body kept going, lean in further, lean in further, even though mentally it didn't make sense. So listening and being on the lookout for what you're not used to looking for mm. is huge because a lot of people have this construct and they can't see outside of the box that they've built for themselves. Yep. And unfortunately, that's where most of the possibility and the magic of life is. It's outside of what you currently know. It's outside of what you currently understand because to get you anywhere outside of the current box you're living in, you've got to be willing to blow up the box and think outside of it, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be my number three. Number four uh, of five would be uh, to be conscious and discerning with who you are sharing your energy with sexually. Uh, I think that and this is just think, this is philosophy. Um, I don't have any scientific proof for this, but there's, I have a belief that when we share our energy with people, when we share, uh, our sexual, like the, the thing that can create another being, right? They just, the, that is one of the most powerful things ever. And when we freely share that with people who are not necessarily swimming in the same vibration, the same place, but we share it because we're lonely and we share it because we have these urges and, and, I think that that can m muck up the water and, and, you know, we want that water to be clear. We want that water to be clean. Um, there's something about being discerning and holding out and trusting that it's coming and, and owning your space. And I'm not saying that you don't have sex until it's the one, but you, I would say, and really lean into, does this feel like the two or the three? Right? Because if this feels like the, the, the 98, I would suggest not <laughs> necessarily doing that. 1047. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the 12. Of beer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll get to the one. Yeah. 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 The one of the We're just going to go through this one yeah. by one. Yeah. <laughs> so if it feels like the two or the three and you're like, oh, I may need to date this person. Like the, the, the woman I dated before Alexi, and Alexi knows her. She's a friend of ours. She's amazing. Um, it was that. It was clear. And, and I told her. We talked about it. I said, I'm clear you're not it. And she was like, yeah, I don't think you're it either. And I'm like, okay, but there's something here. And she's like, yeah, there's something here. Okay, well, let's, let's just date and see and be and like not, no pressure. We're both grown ass people. Let's just be in this. Yeah. And that felt for me, that was like, okay, this is a two moment. This is like, uh, okay, 
I'm preparing for something here and whoever the something is or the someone is coming soon. So let me just be present with this right now and learn whatever lessons are in here. And I think that's really important. So yeah, another way to look at that too, which I always used to tell my girlfriends, it's like the stock market. If you got a stock that's like blown out and like everybody's, you know, it's like being sold to everyone. It's not worth anything. But if you have a stock that's like super high price, and like, it's like baseball hard, cards, yeah, or it's, like, it's, hard, it's harder to get to. It's yeah. worth so much more. And I think so many people are lowering their stock just by like hooking up and doing all the things that the time they meet the actual person, their stock's kind of depleted. Whether this person knows it or not, they know it. Yeah. And, and there's that lack of that sexual creative fortitude. That energy is real. That is the most powerful energy that we have. We can create freaking human beings with that energy, yeah. right? And if we're conserving it and being really cautious and intentional about it, mm-hmm. power. That's like yep. magnetic. Um, number five. Yep. Last one. Be the type of partner you want. And this is so easy to say, but so hard to do. Mm. You know, everyone's like, I want someone who's honest. I want someone who has integrity. Mm. I want someone who's fun loving. I want somebody who believes in this. And it's like, do you actually live in integrity? Like, are you actually honest in all your agreements with people? (laughs) Are you actually showing up as joy and fun? Like, get real about it. I think a lot of people are living kind of this delusional reality of like, I show up a certain way. And it's like, do you? Like really, based on feedback, based on the results called your life, based on your last job or your business or your health or your weight, like, are you in integrity? Mm -hmm. Like, are you actually doing the things that you say you're going to do? Because if you're not even in the smallest area, you can't expect somebody else to. Mm. And I think that's such a big thing that a lot of people are unwilling to truly be honest about is how they're showing up. You can't attract anything other than what you are. Mm. Fantastic. Final thoughts. Yeah. On love and relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are they? (laughs) Uh, Love and relationship. I mean, it's just the greatest playground there is. I think that we all get to keep leaning in. Have you found a new version of unconditional love? What's your son's name? Kingston. Kingston. What a great name. Have you experienced a new form of love with Kingston coming along? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh we, we've, He's we, rocked our world. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> in the best way possible. Yeah. I was uh, jaywalking uh, across the street uh, with a friend on a very busy street the other day. And it, it took me like 10 minutes. And he was like, bro, what are you doing? Like, just run between the cars. <laughs> and I'm like, I have something else to live for. I have more responsibility I, I will now. definitely yeah. not put myself in jeopardy. And like that among a million other things, like it's like we've reached into levels of our heart that we never knew existed. And I say this jokingly, but I know it's true. Alexi loves him more than she loves me. It's a different love. It's a different it's love. Different. Yeah. It's primal. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. like I made you. It's yeah. pure. Yeah. <laughs> it is the purest form. And yeah. same, man. It's like I would I would easily die for her, but like him, I like <laughs> I would die and come back for him. Like, I, I would like, come back, back, back here and be like, I would die for her, but I might have to think just for yeah. a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, there would be a split there's, there's second. A split second. <laughs> for him? Nah, it's, yeah. Yeah. Straight in. Hey, man, it's honest, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah final thoughts on love and relationship for me is um, yes. Mm, say yes. Just yes. It is the most transformative thing and I think so many people who are like trudging through life as the lone wolf Mm. you're missing out you're Mm. missing out on your greatest expression it's not it's not just about this and it's more about what this can activate and like open within you and that's what makes this so magical and I think a lot of people are pulling themselves out of the game or playing the low I'll do it from over here disconnected and I'll just surfacely date because they're afraid of something they're afraid of truly being seen because they don't actually know what's under under the curtain for themselves. And just say yes to that. Because it's it's deep and it's messy, but it's also fucking potent and so magical. If people want to find out more about you, where can we go? Yeah. You can Google stalk me online. At, Google stalk you. <laughs> Google stalk. Okay. At oh, Alexi stalk. Panos. Right. Right. So AlexiPanos.com, at Alexi Panos Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Just search my name and everything will come up. Same for me, Preston Smiles, at Preston Smiles, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And you guys travel around doing speaking workshops. together? Workshops. Yeah. yeah. We do workshops. Our, our, it's the bridgeexperience.com, bridgeexperience.com. And the bridge experience, like what's the 15-second the wrap on that? 15-second wrap on that is you will face off with 
all of the masks that you've been wearing mm -hmm. and find out who's really running the it show. It is the deepest heart surgery you can do <laughs> on the planet right now yeah. as far as somatic and uh, transformational personal development work. Yeah. We go hard. Yeah, and, and to be clear, this is not a speaking motivational nope. event right. where you're going to take, you this are going to work. Yeah. And you will be pushed to your limits and then... And then, mm -hmm. and if anyone wants to do it, make sure you sign up for our level two as well. You have to complete level one, but okay. level two is the best leadership training on the planet right now. That's we built the stuff. leadership training that we wanted to do, yeah, and we've right. done all of them. So, and where can we find out about the Bridge Experience? Is that its own website? Yeah, BridgeExperience.com. BridgeExperience.com. Yeah. Alexi, Preston, bless you guys. Thank you so much yes. for being here. It's been a real Beautiful. honor. Thank, Thank you. you, man. You got it. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host. Kerwin Ray. And do me a favor, don't forget to drop me a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think. I love reading what you guys have to say and your reviews. Make sure we keep creating killer content just like this. If you want to stay up to date with me and all my movements, please jump onto the website, kerwinray.com. And also check us out on social media at Kerwin Ray. 